Hi, it's Carrie, and welcome to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. I recently sat down with my friend Karen Roberts Frenzel and Rita Hayworth biographer. We had an hour and a half long riveting discussion <laughs> on all things Rita Hayworth. We thought it was riveting. Anyway. We thought it was riveting. <laughs> I get home and there's absolutely no sound on the video. So I, I wept openly wow. and I was very upset. It was so sad. So sad. It was so fun, but... but then graciously, Karen has agreed to re-sit <laughs> down with me and redo this discussion. And here we are. And I'm so grateful. Thank you oh, for joining thank me. You for having me. And my dog, Vivian, is also here for the ride. That's around it. I'll <laughs> the That's the thing. So, and Karen is the author of this fantastic book about Rita Hayworth. Rita Hayworth, a photographer, for photographic retrospective. Yep. And where can people find this? Well, it came out in 2001, so it's not in print any longer, but it you can find it on eBay. Um, sometimes it shows up for $100, sometimes it shows up for $20, so you can usually find it at a pretty reasonable price. However, if you buy it on Amazon, it's usually very, very overpriced. So don't buy it on Amazon, buy it on eBay if you choose to buy it at all. But it's a great, it's a great book, I think. Anyway, yes. It's a labor, and labor of love. Tell me, okay, so you told me the story the last time on our ill fated audio. <laughs> You're going to get episode. so bored hearing these No, I, I will never get bored. <laughs> tell me how this book came to be because you have a great origin story, if you yeah. will, about how this book came to happen. So tell us that. Yeah, well, I'd always wanted to, and I've loved her since I was a little girl. I first saw her, and you were never lovelier dancing with Fred Astaire. And I absolutely thought she was the most beautiful, graceful. Uh, woman I'd ever seen, glamorous. Um, so that's where I first began to get interested in her. I was about 10. And then from that point on, I've always loved vintage photographs. So I started collecting vintage photographs of her and continued to do so. And always had, uh, there was a book that came out on Marilyn Monroe um, called um, Her Life in Pictures. And it was by James Spada. And then later, our friend Daryl Rooney came out with this beautiful book on Jane, on Jean Harlow. That's a photographic biography. They were both photographic biographies. And I really wanted to see one on Rita Hayworth and none, one never came out. So I thought, well, I'll try to do it myself. So I always collected pictures with the idea that, hey, maybe I would use this for the book. But I also collected pictures just for my own pleasure. Um, so when I started to, I, I put the book together in its whole form and I pitched it to um, different agents. I wrote about 50 letters to different agents to see if they would represent me. And I had three people respond. And one of whom uh, was, his name was Don Congdon. And he was the, actually the agent for uh, Bobby Kennedy. And so I thought, well, you can't beat that. <laughs> I'll take that company with Bobby Kennedy. So he, um, that agent submitted it to 25 different publishers and they all rejected it. So I thought, you know, I was, I was upset about it, but I thought, well, then I'll just do it on my own. So I sent it to Abrams, which is the publisher that I really wanted to do it. They do gorgeous coffee table books, Abrams, Harry Abrams in New York. And I sent it to them again. And I said, um, cause he had sent it to them and they had said no. And I sent it again and I didn't get any, hear anything back for about eight months. And finally I got a letter and they said, we've been going back and forth on whether to publish it, but we just don't feel like she has name recognition. Like people remember who she is. Yeah. Which I disagreed with. Yes. So from that point, you know, the fact that I was so close was just, oh, you know, painful. So I decided that I would bombard them with how much she is remembered. And every time I saw her in a magazine, every time there was a list of the hundred greatest stars or you name it, when she was in the media in some way, I would write them and let them know. And it changed their mind. And they said, okay, you, we'll do it. And it helped that the president of Abrams at the time was a huge Rita fan, thank goodness. Um, and so he was in my corner, but still just he alone had not been able to get, you know, to get everyone to agree to be on board. So uh, that's how it happened. And uh, and then I had some issues with the Aga Khan because that was uh, Rita Hayworth's stepson and he didn't want pictures of himself in the book. So I've had to take the picture of him out and he had to approve this, that, and the next thing. And, and then Rita Hayworth's daughter loved it. I met with her. She loved the book and approved it. And um, in fact, I have a picture shoot and I don't have it with me of her holding the book. It's a beautiful professional photograph oh, wow. of her in very, looking very glamorous holding the book. I mean, she really likes it and I'm so happy. Um, but so, you know, that took a while and then finally it happened. And, and then it, it was, um, published a week after 9-11, oh, which gosh. of course, obviously in the grand scheme of things, 
my book doesn't matter, but um, it did hinder sales, of course, um, as well it should. And uh, it was a horrible thing that happened. But I think that, um, uh, you know, the book probably would have done better had it been published at a different time. But it, it still sold out. But, you know, I would have liked to have seen a second printing and things like that. So, uh, but yeah, I was very, very lucky. And I, it just goes to show that if you persevere and you really think that there's a, a desire for that out there, and really believe in it, that it can happen. That's what I tell my kids. So. <laughs> That's a great lesson to learn. Persistence is a really important thing. Yeah, it is. Especially if you really do believe somebody, you know, I, I know I really wanted a book like this. And there were books out on other people, on other yeah. stars that were similar, that weren't even as big as she was. So I knew that there was an audience. Um, and she hasn't, her, um, you know, unlike some of the stars from the 40s, like let's say Betty Grable or or well, not even Jean Tierney is still quite well known, but Betty Grable, you know, she hasn't really stood the test of time as well as Rita. And I think it's because Rita has a very, especially her Gilda look, a very contemporary look. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, Betty Grable had very 40s hairstyles. Oh, you know? yeah. Big time. Yeah. So she, um, and also she didn't have a lot of scan, you know, scandal, I hate to say, always helps them, uh, you know, stay in the in the public's mind, unfortunately. Uh, but I think that Rita was like kind of the whole package. And then, of course, she had Alzheimer's disease, one of the first people, uh, really the first famous person to acknowledge that um, mm. that she didn't acknowledge it, but her family acknowledged that she had Alzheimer's disease. So I think a lot of the combination of all those things, um, she was married to Orson Welles, you know, keep her in public. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because this past Thanksgiving, Andrew Schneider and I did an episode about Tyrone Power. We yeah. had his grandson, TK Power. Yeah. And it was interesting when we talked about it because we were thinking, why isn't he more famous? We love him. Right. But then we thought, well, he really didn't have any major scandals. Huh? He really wasn't married to any major stars or, you know what I mean? That's I mean, right. Linda Christian was an actress, but not like. And know. Annabella too, but and she was not super famous. Yeah. yeah. So no major high profile marriages no major scandals. And also he made some great films, but they weren't the Wizard of Oz, yes. Gone with the Wind, Citizen Kane. They weren't what I would call like maybe lightning in a bottle type of film. Exactly. Like Gilda is her lightning in a yes. bottle. That is like the number one film that is mentioned when her name comes up. Correct. So she had that too. Yes. She had the film that, because I made great movies. It's just yeah. none of them were on that level of being that iconic. Right. So it kind of, in a way, outside of people like us, it makes sense that he isn't as well remembered yeah. for those, for those sad. reasons. Sad. It's sad that he isn't. Yeah, it's sad because I think he deserves better. Yeah, I do too. But um, I first saw Rita long before TCM even, I saw AMC. They mm -hmm. showed Blood and Sand. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Tyrone, speaking of Tyrone yeah. Power, and I remember thinking, how can there possibly exist three people that are this pretty? Rita Hayworth, Linda Darnell, and Tyrone Power. That's right, and, and Anthony Quinn. And Anthony Quinn. <laughs> Four people. And <laughs> among them, Rita stood out because that dance scene she does with Anthony Quinn is probably one of the sexiest things I've ever seen. That, as well as the scene she does with Tyrone Power, where she's, oh, yeah. I mean, it's very sensual and she's letting you know she's letting him get only so close you know and and she's you know so desirable to him that you can it's palpable that's a pretty powerful scene she was and and they basically you know that was not her nature innately she was incredibly shy um and they di different directors Howard Hawks is one I can think of off the top of my head who said he literally had to say step by step now do this now do this now do this it, that didn't come naturally to her wow. to be that way um, so that's even more of an accomplishment when you think how well she did it. <laughs> well, I read a quote somewhere from her second husband and director, Orson Welles, who said the whole Gilda thing was completely false. It was like Lon Chaney or something. It had yeah. absolutely nothing to do with the real person. Right. Uh, one of the things that has kind of come up on Hollywood Kitchen several times in our discussions is how the person can be so wildly different from the persona. Right. Like, the who they are off screen almost is like a completely different identity yeah. from who they were on. Which is which is quite a credit to her acting when you when you think about it. I oh, mean, yes. people don't give her a lot of credit for her acting, but she was she was a wonderful actress, especially, you know, she, you can see her actually get better and better as her roles continue. Um, but in Gilda, yes, she was, as you know, there's the famous phrase where she said, which people always uh, say incorrectly, The and I get kind of... Uh, defensive about it because some people will say so I've seen it written so many times that she said 
uh, men have sex with me and and they or have sex with Gilda and they wake up with with me or they go to bed with Gilda and wake up with me. She never would have said have sex, go to bed. She was very dignified. She had um, a very natural dignity. And what she did say, the quote from the interview is, "Every man I've ever known has fallen in love with Gilda and woken with me and wakened with me." And that's a much more classy way <laughs> of saying. You know, they they marry me because they think I'm this person that they see on the screen, and I'm not. Uh, and she wasn't. She was very shy. And and as we talked about the other day, in the movie Gilda, it's actually kind of the same thing. She plays this, you know, ca character who's trying to make Glenn Ford jealous, and she's dancing and she's acting like she's this that. And then they show this side of her, which is really that she's very shy and sweet, and you know, that's in the movie. Uh, and she read and she acts both of those parts very believably. Um, but yes, she had a, a big problem with having to, you know, as she said, Harry Cohen wanted her to live that image until she was 90. Well, you can't live that beautiful love goddess image if you're going to age, you know, which we all do. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why she was so excited when Orson Welles uh, had put her in the lady from Shanghai. Um because he cut her hair and she she was this beautiful blonde, but they took her long red trademark hair and cut it short like uh, and blonde and dyed it blonde. And it's absolutely gorgeous, but it it was a different look and the public didn't necessarily like it. Now, but. I want you to dispel a rumor because I have long heard the rumor that they didn't exactly ask Harry Cohn's permission and that he hit the ceiling when he realized what they had done. Is that true? I don't believe that's true. Uh, I, you can't make a major film like that and fund it. And, and he was also knew always what was going on without getting his permission. You couldn't cut the hair of his great, of the studio's greatest asset without his permission. I think he, you know, was doing it because he thought maybe it was a, a, a good move or maybe he was just going to take a risk or the publicity or, or publicity. Yes. Which, it, and there was a lot of publicity, but he, he had to have known what was going on. There's no way Orson was going to walk up to him and say, I cut her hair. And what are you going to do about it? Because that it would have been a big to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just a myth. Uh, I'm quite sure of it as a matter of fact. And when you talked about how men fell in love with Gilda yeah. and weakened with her, I think that um, I've always heard the story that her second husband, Dr. Orson Welles, saw the Life magazine picture of her in the mm -hmm. lingerie, mm -hmm. which is stunning, one of the biggest pinups of World War II, yeah. and just immediately said, I'm going to marry her. That's what I've read. Um, I mean, again, that's a good story. I don't know. He did do a radio uh, program with her during that time. She was married to her first hus husband, Ed Judson. And but they she and Orson did a radio program in 1941. So they didn't know, know each other. Um, and I don't know if that's before or after, probably is after he saw the pinup. But, you know, he was such an, uh, uh, an egotist. I wouldn't put it past him. Yeah. And then he and, and he was also ambitious and usually achieved his goals. And he, he got that, too. So um, I think that that she was a challenge to him. And then, of course, when he met her, he wasn't prepared for how. Uh, docile and sweet uh, she was because he always talked about just what a sweet, sweet person she was, you know, very insecure and she needed a lot of attention, but just a very sweet person and a good wife. And it seems like Ali Khan also fell in love with Gilda. Yeah. Almost admittedly. Yeah. And yeah, then... but he, I, I read that he used to actually just love it if they'd have a fight because she'd get very fiery then. And then she was more like Gilda. And when she was not like that, she was very, quiet and unassuming. And I think for him, maybe even boring, you know, sweet and wonderful and lovely. But this was a man who grew up in a culture of having any woman he wanted, which he continued after he married her, because that was the culture that he grew up in. And she knew that. I think she was hoping he would be like that once they got married. But of course, he pretty was. hard to change, uh, you know, a leopard spot. So he, um, he didn't change. But again, they always had a wonderful relationship. You know, after I've got some great pictures of them from 1955 with the with Rebecca, her daughter with Orson and their daughter together, um, Yasmin, that Yasmin had never even seen before when I sent I sent oh, her some wow. copies. And there are pictures of them at dinner and playing in the in the snow and having fun and they're laughing, all four of them together. So they were still friends mm -hmm. after they got divorced. And then he died in a car crash in 1960 and she was devastated, absolutely devastated. Okay. And I think, as I mentioned to you before, I think that he was the love of her life. I really do. I think that she really was in love with him and that, you know, she said being with him was magical. Um, and that's sad when you think about it, because 
you know, um, she she went, she met him in 48. They married in 49. She moved to Europe, completely gave up her uh, career, um, left him in 51 and came back to the States. They reconciled in 52 and finally divorced in 53. Um, but I mean, she left her very, you know, she was never uh, ambitious as far as her career, except at the very beginning, you know, she really wanted a family and she wanted to have kids and, um, but she wanted a family that was going to stay together. Um, but, uh, I can't remember where I was going with this, but she, um, oh, that, that after, if you look at, so she came back and starred in both Salome and the, uh, the affair in Trinidad mm -hmm. in 1952, where they were her comeback pictures and especially in affair in Trinidad, there is a light that is missing from her eyes and you see it. If you watch anything pre 48 love pre loves of Carmen, she's very fiery and very, you know, bright eyed and, and anything after that, her eyes in photographs and on film, her eyes look so sad and it's really, and I do, I think it was a one, of, I think it was, if not the major disappointment in her life, it was one of, one of them was that, that marriage ending. And then the following, the after marriages after that were, ugh, you know, Dick Haynes. Ugh. Terrible. And, um, he was a famous crooner who basically yeah. uh, used her to yeah. get attention for his career. Yeah. And she kind of had to marry him because he was going to be deported if she didn't. She felt guilty. I would have said, take him. <laughs> yeah, I deport know, that I know. sucker. But <laughs> deport that man. <laughs> and then um, and then she married James Hill, who was a producer at the end. And I think he actually, you know, he got her some wonderful or helped her get some wonderful roles that really showed off her acting ability. But in the end, you know, he wanted to keep working. She didn't. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, after, she, you know, she had always looked for love. She had always looked for affection and family. And then when she kind of reconciled herself to the fact that maybe that wasn't going to happen for her, she wanted to work. And then she reached the dreaded age of, you know, the age range of the 40s where back in the Hollywood, uh, back in those days, the studio executives thought women in their 40s were done and through. And mm. so then she wanted work and couldn't get it. And then when, you know, and then she started also not being able to remember her lines because she had early onset Alzheimer's. So, you know, everything kind of came to her at the wrong time. And um, mm. so even though there's, uh, she she often said that she didn't want her life, you know, if anyone was looking at her life to think she, it was sad because there were so many happy moments in it. It is kind of hard to look at it and not think it was sad, you know, especially the part where she, you know, was showing all the symptoms of all well, Alzheimer's. They didn't know what it was at that no. point in time. People just thought she was drunk or yeah. she was unruly and they didn't. Yeah. And, and it had to have been so frustrating for her family to know that there's something wrong yes. and not know what that something is. I well, can't fathom how devastating that would be. That was one of the things that Yasmin said after they diagnosed her with Alzheimer's was what a relief, what a relief to find out that there's a name to her behavior because she always thought it was drinking. Even mm -hmm. though she said, I didn't see my mom drink a lot. She said so, I, but I didn't know what else to blame it on. Um, and and she Rita did drink um, because she was frustrated that she couldn't memorize her lines or didn't know what was happening with her. And of course, that exacerbated the mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. So it's a horrible, vicious cycle. But for Yasmin, it was a relief to know, OK, this isn't just my mom. You know, she's not just an alcoholic who's causing these problems to herself. This is a real problem that she has. And, you know, what now we can try to fix it. You know, of course, not, not knowing that it wasn't fixable. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, but until, uh, you know, when Rita, Rita was really the first person that, um, famous person who was, who had Alzheimer's and then Reagan came and then after that, a lot of people. One thing I want to mention is how involved her second daughter with Ali Khan, Yasmin mm -hmm. is with raising money for mm -hmm. Alzheimer's research. So mm -hmm. can you kind of talk about what Yasmin's efforts have been in that direction? She joined with the Alzheimer's Association once she found out what her mother's diagnosis was and they said would you like to help us raise funds and she said absolutely so they started these Rita Hayworth galas um which uh take place still every year I think they started in 85 or 86 they started before Rita died uh -huh. and Rita died in 87 um and they've raised you know millions and millions and millions of dollars but they have these galas uh in LA or in uh, New York and Chicago and then they even had a couple golf tournaments I went to one of the golf tournaments and I've gone to two of the galas um, and they're, you know, very glamorous and very fancy. And I very would expect beautiful. nothing less. <laughs> yeah. And and the golf, I don't golf, but it, it was fun to go to. That was in Palm Springs and that was really fun um, at the Thunderbird, I think is where it was. And um, uh, so she, she 
she had a, a, a singing career that she was pursuing that she gave up in order to help take care of her mom and to raise funds for Alzheimer's. So she was a very loving daughter. And then, of course, she had her own son uh, who was born before Rita died. And so Rita was by that time not able to recognize anyone, but she would bring her son, mm -hmm. Andrew, and put him on Rita's bed so that, you know, they could be together. And um, so, yeah, very sad and mm -hmm. very, very bittersweet. But at least she was able to share her grandson with her mother, you know. But should we start looking at our pictures? Because yes, I've got some I would pictures love then. to do that. Karen has a fantastic photo collection. Before we do that, though, one question, the million dollar question on all these episodes. Did Rita cook? I do not believe she did, which is a great thing because I don't either. Um, she no, I've never seen anything but publicity photographs of her cooking. I've, never, those oh, there are, I've but, seen tons of those with her cooking in a kitchen. But she's usually but. in the studio kitchen. She's not at home cooking. I do have one picture of her now that I think of it with her first husband cooking. But again, there's cameras there. And I know I, I've never heard her kids talk about her cooking. I've never heard any of her husbands talking about her cooking. She was, uh, when she was growing up, she was basically supporting the family with her dancing. So she wouldn't have been cooking then. Wouldn't have had time. Right. And then she was a starlet and a star. And I don't think she ever had time to learn or possibly the inclination, but, and I've never heard Orson Welles say anything about her cooking. I mean, I guess it's possible she did a little bit, but it certainly was not her forte. Um, and so I was, when you asked me to do the kitchen show, I said, I don't cook and Rita didn't either. So <laughs> well, we're going to show pictures instead. When I first started doing these, I would sometimes have people contact me after every episode and go, well, you know, they didn't cook. Why are you doing that? And I'd say, <laughs> the point is it was attributed to them and yes. I'm going to make it. And also it's a fun jumping it's a, off point. It's a very fun way to do it. Exactly. That's why I wanted to do this, even though I didn't cook. I thought, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a way to talk about Rita Hayworth, whether or not we end up talking about cooking or not. Exactly. Um, exactly. But you're right. It's a great way to introduce people to different stars with a with a cute little end result of having a, a cool thing that you made. Exactly. <laughs> and the, for all the publicity photos of Rita in a kitchen cooking, mm -hmm. I have only found two recipes ever attributed to her, which is crazy because I found like a gazillion attributed to Norma Shearer. Yeah. But um, the recipe is from 1937 and it's an, or 38, and it's an angel food cake. Mm -hmm. And then I found a salad dressing one and that's oh, it. That's the one that, so, that I, you got for me, the salad yes, dressing one. Yes, I got one. from yeah. you. I got which, from which you. was on the back of a, of a publicity Lutter. photo. Where she's cooking. Where she's cooking. Which she didn't do. No, exactly. But um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, again, you know, if you look at Marilyn Monroe's career, she did like to cook because you can find recipes, you'll find yeah. notes, you'll find. So I think if someone really does like cooking, you somehow see it in movie magazines about yes. their career and that kind of thing. And or that just didn't come up with even it. like Vincent Price, Joan Crawford. There are some of them that I have covered where I know it's legit. Yes. And the others, again, it's yeah. still fun. Yes, her. exactly. So yeah. let's look at some okay. photos. Okay. So you can just, you can just, these are my favorite photos, some of which are in my book. A lot of them aren't. But they're for whatever reason, and I'll as we go through them, I'll show you, I'll just tell you why they're my favorite or what's special about them. So this one is obviously at the beginning of her career. This is about 1935 when they, before they Americanized her and took away her beautiful Latina uh, looks. And if you see where my, the arrow is, this is where she had the electrolysis done. She had electrolysis done on her forehead because they thought she had a small forehead. So they brought, so they literally took out by the root, each follicle in her. You know, I've actually hair. had some electrolysis type stuff done on my eyebrows. That is so painful. Oh, yeah. And I screamed so loud. I think oh. I emptied the building. Oh my gosh. So, yeah, it's oh, I can't painful. imagine. I mean, when I just yeah. pluck an eyebrow, it hurts. Yeah. So she had that done all around her mm. area here, but particularly yes. uh, over here. But this was at the beginning of her career when she was with uh, Fox before they merged with 20th Century Studios and became 20th Century Fox. She'd been promised the role in Ramona, which uh, eventually she lost when the, when the merge happened and it went to Loretta Young. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that's I, I just think that's a gorgeous picture. Do you want to switch them off? Or yeah, I'll um, go ahead and uh... okay. so this I, and these have no rhyme or reason in terms of, of time period, but I kind of did that on purpose. So this is on at um, Lone Pine during the making of The Loves of Carmen. And I just like this one because it's just very, you know, it's on. I love behind the scenes on the oh, set yeah. photos. They're my favorites. She made this movie with um, Glenn Ford and it was um, directed by Charles Vidor, who apparently was in love with her and, and oh. cried when she married Orson Welles mm -hmm. during the making of Cover Girl, which he also directed. But here she is just walking uh, on the uh, on the location in Lone Pine for Loves of Carmen. You know, 
in uh, researching this episode, you know, I watched a lot of documentaries about Rita and yeah. I've seen footage of Glenn Ford and it looks like he was completely in love with her. Like he almost looks like he's going to cry when he starts to talk about I her. I think he him. was in love with her. I don't think she was in love with him. I think they may have had a okay. short fling during the making of okay. Gilda. And again, you know, I wasn't there. Uh, and Peter Ford says they had a full-fledged many years long affair. Um, you know, who am I to argue with? Glenn Ford's son, but uh, family members of Rita have said otherwise, that that okay. is not what happened, that they were dear friends, but it was not a 30 year love affair or mm -hmm. even a love affair on Rita's part that it was kind of a, if there was anything, it was kind of a quickie affair during the time of Gilda and if that. Yeah. Mm, okay. So who knows? I, I I kind of believe that. And, and I don't think that she always, when you, when she is asked about him, in interviews, she would always say, what? He's like a brother. She would literally would say he's like a brother. And I also don't think that she would have gotten herself involved with someone who was the, the, such a philanderer because he was such a womanizer. And he, mm -hmm. his son admits he cheated on his wife, who was Eleanor Powell, the dancer, you know, all through their marriage. Left, right, and center. Yeah. And Rita knew that about him. And she would not have um, you know, wanted to be with someone like that. What we do know is their chemistry in Gilda yeah. is sizzling. It's like yes. Bogart Bacall. It's like Hepburn. Tri I mean, yeah. it is like they're just they explode yeah. on film. And, and even in so. Loves of Carmen, which he hated because he was he didn't like what he was wearing and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm sorry, I'm turning off my phone here. Um, even in Loves of Carmen, I think that it's pretty spice. You know. Yeah. spicy and they have a lot of chemistry and then they did and then lady in question was their first movie and then they made um gilda and then carmen and then wait I'm, I'm missing one lady in question is the first one oh for heaven's sake they made five it'll come to me loves okay of, gilda loves of carmen uh, affair in trinidad oh yeah and then the money trap was the last one in 66 and by the way i do need to say though if you guys have never been to lone pine california and if you're watching it's really cool they have a museum about um history out there with a big focus on film they have a film screening series they do a film festival and if you go to the local film commission and just tell them you want to see the locations which i did on a trip out there they just put me and my parents in the truck and drove us out and showed really? us all the locations they even had pictures of here's how it looks in this movie here's how it looks today oh, and fun. they could not have been more generous and hospitable and terrific so that's so nice see i have nothing but love for lone pine yeah oh that sounds so fun yeah it was great so let's see here so this okay. was that's lee bowman and this is on the set of uh cover girl and this is the marriage scene and she had actually gotten married on the day that they shot this scene, she married Orson Welles while, you know, just taking a break from work. They went and got married and um, she was just, you know, there were several other couples there that day that also got married. So it's interesting in some of the wedding pictures, there's, you know, Orson and Rita and then, you know, just kind of they were in civilian plain clothes uh, and she was in movie makeup and stuff. And then there's another couple that, you know, they look like young local couple or whatever with these big stars getting married. But um, she was so happy. Uh, and I love this picture because this is probably, except for maybe when she had her children, the happiest period of her life. I also think she was really happy when she was with Victor Mature. And we talked oh, about this before. Yes. She All was, about Victor Mature. We love him. Yeah. Here. She was, she was with him after she divorced her first husband, she was with Victor Mature. And it was really the first time that she ever had uh, adult freedom. And so she was dating Victor Mature and she, he was very funny and she loved that. She was living alone in a rented house for the first time. The one that I went to lap, uh, three years now, two years ago, because uh, it was for sale and they had an open house. And um, so I got to go through the whole house and all of it was exactly the way it looked when she had lived in it. It, wow. it hadn't changed at all. Um, and I took a bunch of pictures of, you know, me in the spots where I had pictures of her in the house. It was really fun. Um, but anyway, I think that was her happiest moment. And the, her, the happiest time was when she was with uh, Victor Mature. And then she met Orson and was equally happy. And then from there, you know, Orson, they got married and then he was cheating and stuff. like. That. And she also, I don't want to blame it all on Orson. She was, she needed a lot of attention and she she would accuse him of cheating when he wasn't cheating. And so like we talked about, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. He was so sick of being accused of cheating that he eventually started cheating. Uh, and he had an affair with Judy Garland. Not that he wouldn't have anyway, but it didn't help that she was saying, I don't trust you and you're cheating when he wasn't. 
think a lot of times in these high profile celebrity marriages, people want to pick a side. Yeah. And I think that things are complicated. It's not just, oh, this one person's the villain. This right. one person's the good guy. It's like, there's a lot of complicated, intricate reasons why something doesn't work out. Yeah. And I think just looking at it from my point of view and Rita's case, it seems like she wanted different things than these men did. Exactly. Like Orson career came first, yep. everything else bottom, bottom of the list. Yep. Ali Khan, he was not going to change his womanizing ways. Yep. End of story. And he was very gregarious, like people around all the time. time she wanted to be alone. Yeah, there's you know. fundamental yeah. differences yes. on which you really cannot build a life if they're not in an agreement right. there. Right. So it seems to me that's kind of a big part of, it kind of what went wrong in yeah. this situation. And in many marriages. <laughs> yeah. You'd think that they, you know, at the ages that they were, that maybe they would have figured it out at that time. Although she was pretty young when she married Orson Welles. But by the time she got to Ali Khan, you'd think that maybe they would have seen that. But she was pregnant. So it, you know, uh, I think they didn't. Somewhat, they didn't have a choice. That probably forced the issue, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, this next photo. So this is on the cover or on the set of uh, They Came to Cordura. And I just love this photo because you know, she's she's older um, and she's absolutely in a completely different way, is so gorgeous. And of course, I know I shouldn't glamorize smoking. I don't smoke myself. But when you grow up looking at movie star pictures with cigarettes, they look glamorous to you. They do. And I just love that she's sitting there smoking. And I love her outfit. And she's obviously rehearsing because she's in rehearsal clothes. But I mean, she's gorgeous. You know, absolutely gorgeous. At a time when people were saying, oh, she's washed up and she can't do anything. Look at her. I mean, she's absolutely stunning. Well, it had to be so hard to be older in the public life when you're a woman. It was then back back then and today, because like we've seen with Madonna recently, it's like if women don't get any plastic surgery and they age normally, which we're all human, right. they're made fun of for looking old and written off. Yeah. And then if they get work done, they're made fun of yeah. for getting worked. It feels like the ultimate no-win situation. Yeah. And I hate it. I could be on a soapbox here, but I hate ageism because unless you die, yeah. you're going to get older. Like yeah. there's not an opt out button no. on this or frankly, we would all push it. Right. So it, yes. I feel That's like why Marilyn is still, you know, such an icon. And I use that word. I hate the way that word is overused. Nowadays, oh, yeah. But Marilyn yeah. is an icon because she died young and we never saw, you know, and Elizabeth Taylor, you know, of course is too, but Elizabeth Taylor definitely had work done and she went that route and, and Marilyn probably would have as well. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's very sad. I don't see, you know, the the women in Hollywood now who age naturally, I think look so much better than the ones that have gotten plastic surgery. They just, you know, the ones that have taken care of themselves and look good, uh, like Susan Sarandon or, or I'm trying to think who else. There aren't that many actually that you can name that haven't had some kind of work done. But uh, uh, oh, Meryl Streep, if she's had anything done, it's she's subtle. done it so well. Yeah. And Rita did have, to have a couple of facelifts, uh, but they were... I wouldn't call them facelifts. I think I'd call them tweaks because she literally, she had incredible bone structure anyway. So yeah. she would respond well to that, but she never, you know, stretched herself or added a cheekbones or got her lips, you know, enlarged or anything. She just did like a little eek, you know, which I wouldn't mind either if I, I mean, if it would end up looking good, but she didn't go that whole route. And they didn't, those women didn't back then, you know, back in the sixties when they were starting to age, they did teeny tiny little things like that. They didn't do the whole, you know, change my look completely uh, like so many of them do now. I just wish that in an American culture, we valued seniors more yeah. because I haven't been yet to Japan or China, but I've heard over there seniors are revered. Yes. And in America, I feel like it's kind of the opposite of yeah. that. I feel like you're old, you're out. And yeah. that's kind of our attitude. And one of the side hustles that I do, um, I do about anywhere from seven to nine lectures a month on Hollywood history at assisted living centers all over that's, Los Angeles. That's fantastic. Thank you. And one of the enriching things I find about it is these people are still people. They're, they have a soul, they have a heart, they have a personality, they have incredible stories yes. and life experience. So much to and offer. So, so much, much to, to offer. offer. And one of them asked me one day, she goes, why do you bother hanging out with us? Aww. And I said, because you know what? This world is real hard. Life is hard. Yeah. And any people that can survive it, like you can, mm -hmm. deserve undying respect. Yeah. And you could have just heard a pin drop <laughs> in the room when I said that. They yeah. were all like, they're like, but we love you, Carrie. It's true, <laughs> it is true. You're right. 
so much more than our looks. Cause yeah. I think as women, especially you're constantly judged on your face, yeah. your hair, your makeup, your body. Yes. And it's like, okay, that is just an outer shell. Yeah. There is so much more to every single one of us than yes. what is on that outside. It's so true. It's so true. Right. But unfortunately, you know, when you are, when it comes, when you're going through it from the time you're a little girl, as we all did in our generation, it just, it's, it's so hard to undo it. Yeah. it. I'd love to be able to say, yeah, well, I don't give a, you know, what I look like. That, you can't, you can't say that. No. We all care. We all have things about us that we don't like. And it's all because we were raised with that stupid, you know, uh, you know, probably also we were looking at people, you and I particularly like Rita Hayworth and people who were airbrushed and didn't look really anything like that in real life. That, that was just perpetuating that problem. But it would, I would love to see that disappear somewhere along the line, you know, where people weren't so worried about and being bullied and, you know, all that oh, kind of yeah. stuff. But, so this is my, um, one of my all-time favorite pictures of her. In fact, it's on the inside cover of my book. Um, and it's from Down to Earth and uh, was taken by Ned Scott, who took all these gorgeous pictures of her for Down to Earth, which is a film I don't like. I'm sorry for all those people that like it. I can't stand it. She looks incredible in it. Her dancing is cred incredible. But she had no uh, chemistry with Larry Parks. And um, I don't really like the musical numbers. Um, but she looked incredible. The publicity photos for this film are the best. Absolutely beautiful. But I just love this one because it's just... This is gorgeous. I've got to say, and you and I have talked about this before, Rita, a lot of her movies weren't as great as people think. Like no. Cover Girl. I saw Cover Girl on a huge screen when I was in college and I was just thrilled. That'd be a great way to see it. But I felt, I felt very divided because part of me was like, she's stunningly beautiful and the dancing is graceful and the Technicolor Rita Hayworth is spectacular. But then the whole Gene Kelly resenting her success yes. and the happy ending was she gives up her whole career to go hang out with Gene Kelly yeah. forever. I was like, I know it's a horrible, it's a horrible message that it's sending, you know? Yeah. And his whole thing is saying you're relying on your beauty too. You don't rely on your beauty. You shouldn't be happy that you got to the top on your beauty. You should be happy that you're going to get to the top by being a hoofer, you know, or a hoofer. <laughs> I don't know if I sound like I said a hooker. Hoofer, a dancer. Dancer, dancer. yeah. <laughs> Um, that's the premise of the movie. And it is, it's just, you know, I keep thinking you spoil male. I mean, let her have her life and, yeah. you know. And why can't you be, why can't she have the career yeah. and the personal, like, why does it have to be either or? Exactly. Like my favorite all-time film is The Red Shoes. Oh, okay. And the first time I ever saw it was like in college. That's the also, it's like, why can't she be a ballerina and be married? Why does it yes. have to be one or the other and exactly. you see and I'm going off on a tangent here but you do see this come up in yeah. movie after movie oh, after for sure. movie the choice and, that they have, they have oh, to make the choice between the career and the man or whatever yeah I know uh and, and that movie I like because also she's gorgeous but yeah it's not one of my favorites the, the numbers are great but uh most of them if you anything fast forward can. past some of <laughs> yeah I can Phil Silvers I don't need to see all of his <laughs> now this is this is Bob Schiffer right Bob Schiffer. she was Rita Hayworth's makeup artist that's right and I met him actually Ooh. and because when I did one of the documentaries that I did uh with on her and um I had he had lost all of his photographs in a fire <gasps> So I had brought a bunch of photographs. Yeah. And I showed him this and I distinctly remember, that's why I love this photo is he was looking at it and I think he was in love with her. Who wasn't? I yeah. mean, in fairness. But I think wasn't? he really was. I mean, wow. he worked with her from the time she started at Columbia until the end. Mm. Um, but there, he looked at this picture and he took his hands and kind of ran it over her profile and just went, oh my gosh, you know, like remembering how mm. perfect she was. And uh, so I just love, love that picture, but he was, they were very, very good friends. Well, I think too, I mean, you probably spend a lot of time with whoever does your hair and makeup. Yeah. So I've talked to other film historians and researchers who've told me that if you really want to know the dirt or the, the real depth of someone, talk to whoever did their hair and makeup, because yeah, that's it. the person that they're going to A, spend the most time with, yep. and B, kind of feel the most intimate in terms of, oh my God, so last night, they're just going to yes. say stuff to you that they probably wouldn't say to the guy who's doing the sound yeah. or the person who's doing the camera work. Or Absolutely. So there's not this like closeness just due to the nature of that relationship especially with her because she had the, the same team at columbia for so long oh, you yeah. know helen hunt did her hair and schiffer did her makeup and you know years and years every single day in the makeup chair you know they had to know everything oh you know? yeah like nothing happened that they were not aware yeah. of I'm yeah sure. i think so but i just think that's a beautiful picture that's on the it's set of so as well 
So this was my Holy Grail photo. So I, as I mentioned before, I love, I've collected vintage photos of her since I was about 10. Uh, and um, I saw this photo in a magazine and had looked for it and looked for it for years and years and years. Cause it's just, I think I knew they were, they had a photo session where they were together, but I think this is a picture where somebody was off the off the set, you know, off uh, out of camera angle, like out of camera range that they happened to look at or maybe say something to while they were shooting the doing the photo session and that's what I think this is is it's oh, kind of an, wow. a, a can a true candid and it's just you know I just love it it's so beautiful and they were such good friends and you can really yeah. you can really tell how much they you know love each other on that photo I, th I think as friends um, and he he maybe loved her more but it's just a great shot I mean she's so stunning I've been so lucky to see this on a giant screen several times including yeah. one year it was the opening night of Noir City at the Egyptian oh, in Hollywood and the minute you see her on screen the audience just goes ballistic that's probably yeah. one of the best entrances yes in movie history yes. because she whips her hair back oh, she just looks God. amazing I know she's just it makes you wonder even though I love the fact that it is it's noir so it's in black and white it would be so interesting to see what that would have been like in color because her hair was red you yeah. know and it would have been you know if you when you watch Carmen and you watch uh cover girl uh you just think you know the color is so gorgeous and her hair is so gorgeous what would that have looked like you know in color I wish they'd find color footage of it somewhere oh, wow. there has been some home movie footage of her in a uh you know coming from work on the set of Gilda and you, you know she's got the red hair and and they're gorgeous, but um, would be really cool to see that in Technicolor like that. Um, so this is the uh, a publicity photo for um, uh, um, You Were Never Lovelier, which was 1942. And uh, it's just a beautiful pinup photo that oh, I always yeah. like. And it was not one that has been seen very often. So this is her and Fred. And so to dispel a rumor, Fred is here um, on the set of, or on the Columbia lot for You Were Never Lovelier. He did not ever say that she was his favorite partner. Because I've heard that. Yes. And I know that's not, oh, now that's not true. I see it. I just saw it in a magazine the other day. And they and they say it's in his autobiography. It is not in his autobiography. And if someone, and I, show me the quote if you have it. Because he would never have said that, who his favorite was. And he said one time, I would never say who my favorite is because I don't want to hurt any of these women's yeah. feelings. He always said Bing Crosby. Because that was, you know, it got him off the hook. He was in two movies with Ben Crosby. And he, I do believe that he really uh, adored Rita, maybe more than a lot of his other uh, co-stars, because Helen Hunt, the hairdresser, said that he gave her a beautiful jeweled ballerina pin. Oh, wow. And, you know, he was very happily married. So that, I, I don't think, that, I don't believe anything happened. He was also much, much older than she was. Um, uh, and she was uh, dating or married all the time that they were dancing together. Um, but I think he admired her and I think he thought she was a very sweet girl. And she knew, he knew that she was a dancer because he had worked with her father, Eduardo, in vaudeville. Oh, yeah. And so he said later, it was so strange to have known Eduardo in vaudeville. And all of a sudden now I'm dancing with his daughter, you know, because she's 24 on here, I think, 24. And, sh and he's... Uh, let's see if it's 40. He's always a year older than the year. So he was 43. So he's quite a bit older than her. Um, but they had amazing chemistry. Oh, and yeah. they made the two films together. They made You'll Never Get Rich, which is 41. And then uh, You Were Never Lovelier in 42. And they were both super successful. But he did not want to make another one because he didn't want to get caught in another partnership like he had with Ginger and like he had, even though it was successful. And like he had had a, a partnership with his sister before he'd been with Ginger and he did not want to do that. So he never made another a uh, movie with someone he never made more than two movies with another leading lady he did the things with Barry Chase the tv shows later mm -hmm. on but and he made four of those but um but no his he loved absolutely loved Rita just thought she was the sweetest and a wonderful dancer but she was she he, he she may have been his favorite in his mind but he never would have said it I think Barry Chase actually probably was his favorite dancer. Now, is this from the Shorty George number? Yeah, she's wearing a coat, though, because she must have been cold or something. So she you can't see the top. But yeah, this I love this because they're both just laughing and smiling. She's laughing and smiling. And it's on the set of, of You're Never Lovelier. And um, yeah, it's while they were shooting the Shorty George number. And this is from uh, My Gal Sal. This is a uh, wardrobe test shot, which I love because these are very hard to find, especially of her. Um, oh. And this is, uh, and I mentioned this in the last in our aborted um <laughs> our video. failed sound our failed, uh, yeah but if anyone wants to look at some incredible wardrobe color footage of Rita Hayworth they should go to historicfilms.com 
and okay. just look up Rita Hayworth. And there's several long uh, pieces of wardrobe and hair color footage from my gal Sal and Blood and Sand because they were Fox when she was a 20th Century Fox, um, as well as Jean Tierney, Betty Grable, uh, June Hayworth, wow. all these people, Tyrone Power, um, Anthony Quinn, all the big Fox people. But she was loaned out to Fox. And so the two movies that she made there, um, they have her wardrobe um, uh, footage. And it is unbelievable because she's smiling. She's And it's silent. She's smiling. She's laughing. She's joking with these people. She's twirling around in these gorgeous costumes. Mm. I mean, you have, if you love Rita, you absolutely have to see it. I will be yeah. doing that later today. <laughs> Trust me. On you're going to, you're going to love it. I watch all of them, every single one of the, not just Rita's, but all the stars, because they're fascinating. Oh, this is another really good one. Right yeah, here. I love this. And this is when she was on loan to Warner's Okay, and she made uh, strawberry blonde. And I just think this is a really beautiful, really different. And it's not shot by the people that the Columbia photographers who often shot her in a very similar way. It's a different kind of pose because it was done by Warners and probably Scotty Wellborn, I'm guessing. And this one is just kind of a wacky hairstyle. And this is very early, I'm guessing maybe 38, uh, 39. Um, okay. But they it's it's a hair, uh, you know, hair She's modeling a hairstyle. Which they look is kind of like victory roles, <laughs> which have become really yeah, popular they do, in the 40s. They do. Maybe that's why she was wearing them. I'm not sure. But I just think it's a sweet picture and very much not the sexy love goddess, more of just the sweet girl next door. This one I love because it's beautiful. And um, she never had a real wedding dress. So she actually had uh, an alternate of this photo, the full length version um, in her home that when she, after she married Ed Judson, she had this photograph of her wearing this wedding dress that was not her wedding dress, but it must've meant something to her mm -hmm. that she would have either liked to have had a wedding or something, but you can see photos of her uh, in her house in the early forties, late thirties, early forties. And you can see that picture in the background. Um, the close up one here is I think the most beautiful. It's just stunning, but this is about 1939. And this is 43. This is during the time that she was shooting um, cover girl. And again, that's kind of a different, you know, she's got a turtleneck on, she's got the very 40s hair, and it's kind of a different pose than you usually see. And this I love because, um, yes, this is Rebecca, the daughter by Orson, and she looks just like Orson. Yeah, that's got to be, that's yeah. got to be interesting. She looks very much like Orson, but Rita was ecstatic, you know, about having a baby. And um, I just think this is a great picture. I just love that Rita looks so happy and she's so gorgeous and, um, and you know, that she had this baby that she want you know, she wanted kids so much. And she always said about her daughters that they were the greatest things that ever happened to her. And she was a very loving mother, but as, um, Rebecca later said, you know, back then the women put their husbands first, they didn't put their kids first. They put their, that's the way women were raised back then. And that doesn't mean they all chose to do that, but I know, a lot of my aunts and my mother, you know, they always talked about their husbands and not so much about their kids. And I'm, as a mother, I'm just the opposite. I put my kids first. That's why I'm divorced. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean, I don't know if I'm kidding. <laughs> but That's I, right. your kids I, are awesome. Yeah, so. I, I always put my kids first. And so, um, you know, I remember Stephen Bogart, Humphrey Bogart's uh, son with Lauren McCall also said, you know, my mom would go off to Africa to shoot the African queen to be with my dad. And we were just left, you know, and that's what women did back then. And wow. that's what she did. She always put the husband first. She wouldn't put the work first, but of course she had to, you know, rate, pay, for pay for everything. Exactly. But um, so Rebecca said, you know, my mother was very loving and very warm when she was there, but she wasn't mm -hmm. always there. So um, I think they both, I think both she and Yasmin had a tough childhood in that regard. And both, you know? plus when you've got both parents that are super world famous, that's got to be really psychologically hard oh, to kind of absolutely. deal with that. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is the famous haircutting session. That's Helen Hunt, who I talked about before, who was her longtime hairdresser. And this was preparing her to um, have her haircut for the lady from Shanghai. And she's, and there's the finished uh there's the result, which I love. I absolutely love. And I, I mentioned this to you once before, how in The Lady from Shanghai, I think the most beautiful footage of her or one of the top five of her on screen is the super, super close up. And Orson Welles was the director. So he's the one that arranged that super close up of her singing, Please Don't Kiss Me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and she's <laughs> just perfect, you know. 
Um, but I love this because she's clearly she's happy to be start doing something different where she can maybe show off her acting chops. She's cut off all this hair that she's been associated with for so long. She's going to be with Orson in Acapulco. And when, they were separated, but then for the making of the film, they were together again. And then when the film was over, they separated again. But um, she was, you know, excited about this period in her life. I kind of argue that Rita Hayworth and Veronica Lake were probably the two most famous for their hair. And yeah. then they both had to change their hair, Veronica for the factory That's statue, right. because the long peekaboo would get caught in the machinery. Right. And then Rita did it for artistic reasons. But it's yeah. kind of interesting how that hair to a large degree kind of defined their personas. Yeah. And, and, and in uh, Veronica Lake's case, after she cut her hair, she really didn't do anything very you know her success because kind of when and she didn't look like the same person no she either. didn't she didn't Rita still did though uh, so I is... love this because um all the I keep saying how gorgeous she is I mean how many times can I say that but I, I it, she's almost otherworldly gorgeous you know where you look at her and think how could anybody be that beautiful now I don't like this movie Salome but uh her hair her makeup her clothes are so out of this world and this is just her sitting on the set and she just you know it's perfection I mean I think that's why I also like her and I also like Marilyn is they they're just my idea of of feminine perfection like ideal the the way they do their hair the way the clothes that they wear their the way they look I think when I was a little girl it started out just being like oh I want to be like them you know and then as you get older you want to know more about their personal lives and stuff but she just you know just sitting on the set like that she just looked incredible Horrible movie though. So I love this one. This is oh, yeah. Anne Sheridan. And this is about 39 or 40. And I don't even know, this is at some nightclub because I also have a picture of her with Ed, her first husband in, where she's wearing that outfit. But I just think it's so cute because they were both just really um, rising at this point because uh, Anne Sheridan was at Warner's and Rita was probably at Warner's during this. I mean, that's probably how she knew Ann Sheridan was she was being loaned out to Warner's. What these. I like about this photo is so many times I feel like in old Hollywood or even now, women are pitted against each yeah. other. And there's always this mentality of there's only room for one woman in one field and that's going to be you or whatever. yeah so to me the idea that these women could be friends yeah. and they didn't have to all be feuding or fighting over roles or fighting over men that they could be buddies yeah. and that they could be colleagues and friends and yeah I love that so this photo actually is really terrific I I think this is probably one of my favorite ones you showed me isn't that great I, and I think that with Rita too Pete women um First of all, she was very, very shy, so she was very hard to get to know, but she wasn't someone who was competitive. She couldn't have cared less if if some woman came on who was more beautiful than she was, or even though there probably wasn't anybody, but um, she, like Jean Arthur, when she made Only Angels Have Wings, Jean Arthur wouldn't even be in the same photo with her, wouldn't even be in the same photo with her because she was so intimidated by Rita's beauty. Well, Rita Hayworth had none of that in her. She was a sweet, nice person, very shy. So a lot of people didn't get to know her, but she would never be in competition with someone like that. I mean, when when she made Pal Joey with Kim Novak, they got along great. And even though Kim Novak was kind of moving in to Rita's place, Rita didn't care. Um, so this is again, a cute picture of her after the uh, haircut. This is on the set of um, You Were Never Lovelier. And I just, this is just a out of rehearsal photo um, and I just love it because it's either she was shooting possibly or she was rehearsing. It's just a cute picture. It's a snapshot. So it's, that was actually taken by a fan. It's a oh, gorgeous picture. Here's another. Yeah. And this was after she left Ali Khan and she was actually on a at a nightclub with Bob Schiffer. But again, this kind of captures her shy d demeanor. You know, this is, yeah. I think, the more the real Rita that you're ever going to see was just very quiet. And I love this one. This is Errol Flynn and her um, during the um, junket for Santa Fe Trail. And she was working with Warners at the time and it was all they were all Warners films Santa Fe Trail Virginia City it's just a cute picture of them together that you don't see very often so here she was pregnant and making Tonight and Every Night and that's why she's got this canister in front of you it's to promote Cover Girl but she was actually filming Tonight and Every Night which is another movie that I actually really love it's in color and has some of the most beautiful shots of her that you will ever see um, but I, I just think that's a cute picture and anytime you see her hair like that with her where it's parted on the middle and she's pregnant usually this one is kind of from the old when she was making fire down below um and so she's you know aged a little bit but i love it because it's not retouched at all you see the wrinkle i mean she's still drop dead gorgeous but i love that it's completely unretouched you see the real she's got makeup on but you know this is also during a fair and trinity or not um uh one i just met fire down below uh, and it's another just a fun candid i love pictures of her where she's happy and smiling 
This is at Grauman's. And this was during the making of Tales of Manhattan. So you see Charles Boyer, Edward G. Robinson, Charles Lawton, and Sid Grauman. But the three leading men were in the film with her. And I love that picture. Look at her cool shoes doing. Oh, yeah. shoes. <laughs> I want that suit. This is a period where she was with Victor Mature. And I actually blew this up because she's with him in the photo, but uh, it's just such a stunning photo of her. And she was so happy. And, um, you know, that's all. She's just gorgeous. <laughs> just my two sons. And I have talked about this at great length with his daughter, Victoria Mature. Yeah. But we wish he and Rita would have ended up together. I think Victor would have been a lot better bet than Orson. I just too. my two sons. I do too. I absolutely agree. I mean, I don't know if it would have lasted, but it, I think that he would have been a better husband. Absolutely. So here she is with Harry Cohn, uh, her nemesis, and Anita Louise. Uh, and um, even though she couldn't stand Harry Cohn, she would be in photos with him. And there are pictures of them together smiling. But he, uh, you know, he made life very difficult for her because she wouldn't sleep with him. And yet she still went to the top at Columbia. I mean, the public loved her. It didn't matter whether she slept with Harry Cohn or not. Is it true that her first husband, Edward Judson, tried to pimp her out and get her to sleep with him or anybody? Because yeah. I believe that rumor too. I know I have too. And you know what? I don't know what to believe about that. I, d I just okay. don't know. I, I don't. It's hard to know. I all I've never heard of her sleeping around. I heard she had an affair with uh, Anthony Quinn during the making of Blood and Sand, and that's really the only one I've ever heard about during the time she was married to Judson. So I kind of think that might not be true. She wasn't somebody who had. I mean, she was not. She wasn't. Um, she wanted to be a star, but I don't think she would have gone. I mean, if she was going to sleep with direction. anyone, not, why not sleep with the boss? You know, if you're if you're that way. But she refused him, and I think. She, I don't think that's, what, that she was like that. He maybe tried to do that. At well, Johnson, I have no but, question. He... <laughs> but yeah, but he, he was like, Bleh. but he did, he obviously captured, he, he saw in Rita things that other people didn't see. So this is when at her divorce uh, from Judson when she was in court. And this is another picture you don't see very often, but I just, and it's interesting because she looks sad and just tired, big, tired, she's got big, no retouching or anything, but it's still oh. a beautiful picture. And I love her hat. <laughs> And this is um, when she's at the press conference to um, announce the filming of um, Fire Down Below. So she was with Jack Lemon and another happy picture. I just love the happy pictures. So this is with uh, no eye makeup. She's got lipstick on, but no eye makeup or anything like that. And um, I have a variation of this in my book, but I just love it because it's just so natural. And I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even recognize her. Yeah, it actually doesn't quite look like her mm -hmm. at this point. So this is her with her father, Eduardo, on the left, and on the right is her grandfather, who they call Padre, and he was also a dancer. So she came from this long generation of dancing, of dancers, and she started dancing when she was, well, learning when she was, by the time she could walk, um, but actually supporting the family with her father when she was 13. So, but this is a very rare photo. I wish I would have had this photo when I did my book, because it's not in my book, and it's a really rare photo. And again, this is another candid that I love. I love the candids. And this was taken by a fan. And then oftentimes if the fan lived in Los Angeles and took a picture, then they'd wait for her after uh, work at the studio and get her to sign the photo. So I just think that's a naturally beautiful photo. Yeah. And this one too, where she's pregnant. I mean, can you imagine having a candid photo taken of you that looks like that? Wow. I mean, just stunning. Um, but that's one of my all-time favorites. And again, a pregnant photo. Um, during a radio broadcast, she was pregnant with Rebecca here, who was Orson Welles' uh, child, um, and very, very happy, very happy period in her life. This one, too. This one, too. And there, so you can see she's actually wearing a maternity outfit, but I think this is outside their home at the time. Well, the hair's not split down the middle or parted down the middle, though. No. Oh, no, you're right. That That's what makes me think maybe it's later. Okay. Because after she had um, Rebecca, then she went back to the side part. I shouldn't say she wore you know, constantly that way when she's pregnant. But most of the photos that you see where her hair is in that style, she's pregnant. Okay. I shouldn't say she always wore it that way uh, when she was pregnant, though. But I love that one. And this one I love, too, because this came from her and Orson's secretary. And I Shifra. love it. Shifra Heron. Mm -hmm. And it looks like, it, to me, I don't know what's happening here, but it looks like maybe she's getting ready to go out for the evening and she's having this picture taken of Rebecca and their dog Pookles before she goes out to getting her hair ready. And I just love it. She's just wearing her checkered pants and, you know, it's a real, real, it's glamorous, but it's also an at-home photo. This is, that's Bob Schiffer that she's with there. Um, and this is after uh, Ali Khan. 
And so she looks very sad there, but she, she does. Did, yeah. But she yeah. did go out dancing and it looks like she's wearing jeans. So, it, which is, they're all wearing kind of casual clothes. It looks like, so I'm not sure where they are, but um, she, you know, it might be during the time that she was in Reno getting the divorce. It might mm. be during that time, but I just think it's, it's sad, but it's also very pretty. So this is her and Orson, uh, publicity for a lady from Shanghai, which uh, you and I talked about as a good movie, but I don't really know what's going on in it, but you know, I don't either, but there are some noirs, I think, including um, The Big Sleep or To Have and Have Not, where you don't always know what's going on. Yes. But the ride is so fun. You <laughs> yes, just yes. kind of stop caring. Yeah. You know, yeah. the only thing I don't like or not the only thing, but one of the things I don't like about it is his voice is loop, loop, dubbed. It's his voice, but they looped it later. And I, I hate that. In fact, that's one of the reasons why some of the 60s movies are so hard for me to watch I'm trying to think of the one that I was watching recently where the entire thing was was dubbed later. And I just, I, it's hard. I know they had to in some cases, but in this one, there's so, maybe because they were in Acapulco and they weren't on location, so they had to, but it's hard to watch that when it doesn't sometimes look right with the, even though they do a good job of the lip syncing, it doesn't sound right. But that's a beautiful picture of them together. This is one of my all-time favorites from Shanghai. It's just absolutely perfect. And of course, she's smoking, you know, elbow length gloves and the beautiful dress. I mean, just perfect. And of course, the famous Hall of Mirrors sequence. She's yeah. in that film when she's I know. like, oh, I don't want to die. It's like, it's pretty chilling it's, stuff. It is. Yeah. That particular line, I agree. She's just, yeah. her acting is so good. So underrated yeah. as an actress. I agree. So underrated. And then here she is again during, they're getting ready to go to Acapulco where they'll shoot the movie. And she was very happy because they were reconciled for that period. This is, you know, this is for separate tables. And of course her acting in this movie is phenomenal. So good. Yes, oh, so good. Yeah. And I think that not enough people appreciate that. This was her favorite role that she ever had. And it's too wow. bad she wasn't allowed more of, the, of that kind of role because she was just so good in it. This is a makeup uh, and hat test. Uh, and this is for You'll Never Get Rich. And I just love these because, again, I, I'm retouching. You can tell she's got a lot of movie makeup on. It's very thick. Uh, but I love that it's not, you know, retouched at all. You can see all the little blemishes and like a normal person, you know. And I love this one, too, because it's the back of her dress <laughs> and her hair. There's several pictures that I have of her where they show the back and the front. And I just think they're fun. This is the front. This it's is the, the last one. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> and that's from also from You'll Never Get Rich. But. Yeah, those are just some of my favorites. I have so many favorites. It's not, in fact, when we were we did the first round of this show, mm -hmm. I had, you know, about a hundred photos, and I just cut them right in half, just because. Maybe next time I'll show them. Yeah, so. well, the, we'll do this <laughs> first. I'm in a separate segment from you and I, I'm going to make the angel food cake. Yeah, so good. well, we can also do another interview, and yeah. then I'll do a separate segment where I make the salad. Yes, that right. would be so, awesome. That would be great. Well, Karen, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for and having me, this is so thank, fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so happy I caught you while you were in Los Angeles. Well, I'll and, be here. I mean, I'll be here off and on all the time for work, and also for. Just because I love LA so much. I can't be away for very long. And I love seeing you and all my friends. Yes. And so it's so nice to be back. So fun. And thank you so much for being patient and getting me, uh, for us to be able to arrange for me. To yes. Well, you too. You too. And thank you, Karen, for being yes. with us today and sharing your incredible Rita Hayworth knowledge. Thank you You're to welcome. everybody watching. And please stay tuned for more food, fun, and film history from Hollywood Kitchen. Bye. Bye.